much money for them. Uh, if you say, boy, you know what? The preacher's on to something there about having, you know, emergency lighting and a romantic evening. You go get you another one, all right? That'd work. Um, and of all things, Avon. I see it now, Larry. I'm going to have to learn how to say that in French. I see that now. Wow, that's impressive. I think for the second service, Matt, if it's possible... I don't, I don't even know what pictures you have. Is it set to music or anything? It is? For the second service, I think we'll just show our camp, some, some of our, our camp video and pictures. Have us a song, I'll say just a word or two. I did, I did have one special privilege of driving down. Miss Tame and I drove around Thursday. But I did have one special privilege, didn't even count on it. I just happened to be coming back from the office and and uh, Brother Kurt Skelly walked through and we just took an office area and we sat down and talked for over an hour and a half. And that was a real blessing to me and some special things that we wanted to talk about. We were connected from the past in, in very, some very unique ways. And um, so maybe I'll share a word or two about that in coming up. But second service, all the young folks that are here, Let's, let's see some of our camp pictures and, and so from the, from the week. Let's do that. And that, that'll help me out also. Brother Steve, let's have another hymn. I looked at these and the first thing I thought was marshmallows. Hershey's <laughs> candy bar and a graham cracker. Also, I actually took one of these with me to uh, a tree sale during, during the spring when it, temperatures dropped to the 20s. And I lit one of these and heated the car so the roots wouldn't freeze on the trees. And this was all it took. So us guys can actually find big manly uses for these. <laughs> okay, hymn number 354, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. <laughs> what a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer oh what peace we often forfeit oh what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer are we weak and heavy laden cumbered with a load of care precious Savior still our refuge take it to the Lord in prayer do thy friends despise forsake thee take it to the Lord in prayer in his arms he'll take and shield thee thou find a solace there when you see someone just sitting and grinning or have just out of the blue have a big smile on their face you kind of want to know what hits them don't you I saw look did y'all see Ella sitting over here she just started grinning real big why you're not going to tell us, are you? No? What was you thinking? Nothing? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for coming this morning. An un Talk about a good title I could have used. An undisguised message. Turn with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. Oh, boys and girls, we're ready to go to Children's Church.
Josie, can I tell them what you all did for fun yesterday? Running a sawmill, helping their dad make boards for their porch, for their new, for their new room in the house. It just tickles me about these young people out there learning to do things like that. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 11. Well, that'd help us remember it, wouldn't it? 7 11. Sometime we'll have to come up with a message and call it the little general or something. Philippians, well, that was Wednesday night. The little general. That would work for Gideon. I'm the least, that, that might have worked. Philippians 3, verse 7 through 11. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. If there's just one verse that had work for the theme of the message, it'd be verse 10, and just the first phrase, that I may know him. When I said an undisguised message, use that as a title, because I work hard on picking titles for messages that will help us to remember that message. The title is important, and sometimes it's in a roundabout way with a clever word or something that will connect to some portion of the message later on. Case in point, just in the past week we had a Bible study and then a morning message on leaving Joppa, the city of Joppa. The grand truth in that is that Jonah went down to Joppa to get to get on a ship and flee to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah went to Joppa to get away from doing God's will. In the New Testament, Peter lived at Joppa and worked with a temp and worked in a vocation there. Peter lived in Joppa and the great sign gift of the sheet that came down and God saying go to Caesarea and take the gospel to Caesarea, and Peter was hesitant to go to Caesarea. Think of this now. Jonah and Peter both spent time in Joppa. One was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, and the other one was hesitant to do it. Both were called to go to a capital of the Gentiles and of a pagan culture, Nineveh and Caesarea. Both did not want to take the gospel of grace to those places for whatever reason. So using the title, Leaving Joppa, I come on a roundabout way to help us remember, are you running from God's will or running towards it? Are you willing to take the gospel to those who need it most? Or with our own prejudice, or whatever reasons, our own insecurities, our own pride, we would be willing to stay in job and not take someone else the gospel. Another thought was in that message. The amazing power of God's grace that Nineveh and Caesarea would both see a mighty work of God where you'd least expect it. So I use that by way of illustration to go back and re rehearse the message a little bit, but also to say with that title, Leaving Joppa, 
I came in a roundabout way to those major to those points. Very seldom would I just very seldom do I just have a title that is the main point. No disguise, no no way to work towards it or you see put things under it and come to it. This title is simply this a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I had, the, I had the title up at the farm. I prepared the message on Monday. Brother Kurt Skelly confirmed it for me on Thursday. He said, that is the missing element in most young people and most churches. That's it. So just in talking, even Brother Skelly said, that would be, if we wanted a disguise title, that would be the missing link. That would be the major element. That would be the element. There's a cartoon animated movie in the theaters right now, Elements. You remember the old days in chemistry when you, we learned elements? And what would be the maybe the foundational or the main elements, the solids or which ones would be ethereal, would be gases, but the elements. We remember the elements. We remember the composition. We deal with protons and neutrons and et cetera, things like that. And how many of they'll have of this and how many they'll have of that. H2O, water, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. What is the fundamental element of the Christian life, what is the print, what is the missing link that most young people, most churches, most schools? That's it. I'm not going to hide it. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In the one message that I was listening to, I heard the word said, and just in passing. He said, are you just here on the coattails of someone else? I heard that statement. That's, I, that's something I had written down. A lot of people are in church on what we call coattail Christianity. You're here. I say you're, I'm just using an expression message. You're faithful folks here to be here on Sunday morning, Father's Day. But let me express that that way. Many, if not you're here, you're in church because grandma and grandpa were in church. You're here and you're in church because mom and dad are in church. You came on their coattails. That used to be used in political terms. He's just riding that man's coattails. He's just hanging on, you know, going, following him along. Now stop and ask yourself. The main point of the message is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But is my Christianity just coattail Christianity? I'm riding, I'm, I'm riding along on someone else's Christianity. The other would be coerced Christianity. You're still of an age, you're forced to come. You're made to come. The statement we used months ago about a young person said, you know, I had a drug problem when I was little. My mom and dad drugged me to church. My mom and dad drugged me to vacation Bible school. My mom and dad drugged me to Sunday school. My mom and dad drugged me to revivals. I had a drug problem when I was little. But there comes a day when, you know, you're free from coerced Christianity. You don't, you're not made to go anymore. You have to choose whether you want to. I have in my office, the book title was mentioned. The fellow couldn't remember the title, but he was speaking to the sponsor. He was talking about, there's a book talking about this, how many kids turn 17 and a half, 18 years old. And he said, fleeing the church, fleeing the church. I had the article in the front of my bulletin, and wouldn't you know, I just threw it away, of the, how the population and the attendance of church has dropped 50% in the last 25 years. And most of it's young people. Because, let's not hide the title, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
is missing. It's coerced Christianity. There's also, I don't know how close these three could all be put together, tried to stay with the seat. You see, uh, some folks attend church all, only as long as they're curious, wanting to find out something about it. But uh, maybe it's what we'd call civil Christianity. We would say this is the institutional and name only. Yeah, we're Christian. Whereas the rest of the world knows us, we're the Christian West. And for a while it was, well, for a while, it's amazing. From the colonial period up into the Civil War period, it's something like uh, 78 or 80 percent of people church as rural as they were were in church on sunday attending a church service uh, there's been heights of where it exceeded that uh, just before and just after uh, world war ii man church attendance was at all times high but nine out of ten people were attending church somewhere no wonder norman rockwell would paint sunday morning and show mom and dad you know and all had and walking to church you ever drive through a community and wonder why there's a big brick church and 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 a big brick church? They may have been different denominations, but that's how many people went to church. So if it would be civil Christianity uh, or casual Christianity, just attending because it's the institution and that's what that's what society did for a while. But the missing element is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That means, that means Ella doesn't come to church because Grandpa wants to church. That means Ella someday will go to church because Ella has a relationship with Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean Karis will continue to go to church when she's 19, 20, 21, 22, because dad goes to church, means Karis will go to church because she has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I can put one after another. That's why you say, Brother Rick, you, why you commend some fellas that come. I'll take Tanner. Why you commend them for going to church? Because now they're not under the authority that mom and dad said, you must go to church. Or I go because grandpa goes to church or grandma goes to church. I go to church. I get up and I go to church because it's the Lord's day. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't end when the camping years end. Every time I, I think about it, it was, I was asked, how long, how, when's the first time you came to the wilds? 1984. <laughs> I got to think about that. That's kind of dating me, isn't it? 1980, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s, now we're in 2020s. I've seen a lot of changes. But I got to think about that. That's the first time at the wilds. I got to think about that. So there comes a day when I can think back and I think of all the seniors and I knew he's taken for the last time. I thought, man, I'll miss that kid. That's, that's the best group I have. And then, you know, lo and behold, a few years later, that's a, that's a great girl. That's a great kid. Boy, I'm going to miss when they're gone. Senior after senior. But there comes a time when your camping years are done. Unless you go back as a sponsor, a counselor. There comes a day when you're Christians. There comes a day when you're not under the authority of mom and dad. Said this is what this house does. So I say to young people, but I'm going to say it to adults also. Don't come to church because of, of it's just curious or because it's a coattails because mom, dad, grandpa, grandpa, something like that. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? It'll make all the difference. Oh, let me see if I can go on to this. I'm going to stress the importance. John 3, verse 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. The straightforward teaching of Jesus Christ, before answering any other question to Nicodemus, before addressing any other curiosities, let's go and talk about the complexes, uh, complexity of, of creation. No, the first thing, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Except a man be born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven. Don't need to go any farther than that. Um, 
the good man that was here with us for the wedding of Matthew and Sarah and the dad, and he said, he, you know, he'd been raised in church, thought he was a Christian, joined the Marines, got sent to Vietnam, first firefight, he sat there and he called up to heaven and said, I knew right then I was a professor and not a possessor, he said, and it dawned on me, I needed Jesus. <laughs> Foxholes in a firefight will have a tendency to do that, won't it? Because there comes a day, the scripture said in Matthew 5, said, but I say, unto, well, I was reading a passage, I think I jumped, jumped past it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many that be go in thereat. But narrow or confined is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus goes on to end that same message this way. Many will say unto me, in that day, this is the day of the Lord, this is the day of judgment. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I'm just going to say, in that day, the most important thing that can be answered is, did you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Not how much money you gave, not how many good things you did, not how much you accomplished in life, not how well you were thought of at work, not how the family thought you was the greatest thing since sliced bread. The most important thing that will ever be answered in that day will be, does Jesus Christ know you and do you know him? I come back to this passage and I say, can I recognize the big difference? Can I see how different it is? Let Paul express it. Philippians 3, verse 7. And what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. We'll use verse 7 before we come to verse 8 and just to, to see how much he em emphasizes this and how he does it. The things that are gained to him are mentioned in the previous verses. They have to do of being born into privilege. Now, I think that can be comparative too. Myself compared to the rest of the world, and I say the rest of the world, maybe not entirety, but as good a good percentage of the world, I realize how blessed I have been to be born in America. Been blessed to have a roof over my house, uh, over my head, all the way through. Have been blessed to have been fed and don't don't know about going to bed hungry or. Uh, physically challenged you know to find a meal i've worked in the bus ministry long enough that i can think back through families from florida to here to to working in the bus ministry in chicago for a while yes there are cardboard when i was there there were cardboard tents cardboard shelters in the chicago landfill where people without homes children would stay at night I worked the projects. <laughs> One time we were supposed to have a big Sunday and have try and get 100 on our bus route, and bless her heart, Tammy had a stereo that she had all through her teen years, teen years, years. She gave me her stereo and allowed me to give it away on the bus route for the kid that brought the most visitors. And I can still see to this day that kid running across the projects in Chicago with, that, with Tammy's stereo on his shoulder. <laughs> Remember it now? But I, I went up and down those high rises where the garbage was in the stairwells and campfires were in the hallways and brick and solid walls so they wouldn't, you know, wouldn't burn and, and doors open and no, no heat. And, and I just seen little kids everywhere. That's how, that's how they were brought up. I was never brought up that way. So as far as the rest of the world majority of the world I, I've been privileged to be this but I know this I wouldn't be what you'd call a blue blood you know they call about blue blood basketball or football programs it's the idea that they're a royalty in that sport because the idea if you're born in the blue blood you're the house of Windsor you're the Vanderbilts or you're the Rock, Rockefellers or you're the Rothschilds or something like that you were born into mega wealth what's that statement it had a Silver spoon. You was born with a silver spoon in your mouth. I doubt that there's anybody in the room here this morning born into that kind of privilege. That the moment you were born, you are already a multimillionaire or billionaire. 
the House of Windsor. Yes, that is King Charles now. Yes, that was Queen Elizabeth. Yes, that is several hundred, hundred, several centuries worth of accumulated wealth. They said, how wealthy was Queen Elizabeth? Unestimable. J.K. Rowling, they can put a, even though she's a billionaire, and they could, you know, the Harry Potter, thing, they can put an estimate on her wealth, but not on the House of Windsor. So much land, so much art, so much gold, so much jewels, they can't, unestimable. I wasn't born into that family. How about you? You weren't born a multi-billionaire. But Paul would say that the way he was born, he was born into the privilege of two, empire, uh, of two nations. He was born a freeborn Roman citizen, and he was born a freeborn of the, of the house of Judea. He considered him one of God's chosen people and also a free citizen of the Roman Empire. He was born under privilege, and he knew it. He would also say that he was born with educational privileges. I have talked. I talked with a man who was an executive vice president of a, of a college in Virginia. A very prestigious job. And very pretty, and he just was saying, yes, there is institutional envy. Yes, there is institutional jealousy. Yes, colleges are in a fight to obtain students, and they have to present themselves. And he said, there is, there is, own words, an elitism. Some have it more than others. If I say, Brother Rick, where'd you graduate? I graduated from Pumpkinville University. North Carolina. I'm not going to get the respect if I said I graduated from Harvard. I'm just saying this, so by way of illustration, there are the Ivy League schools. There are the schools that will receive over 30,000 applicants to get in, and they will narrow it down to less than 2,000. They had quite an article about this young man who, perfect score. How do you get a perfect score on an SAT? Perfect score. But has conservative beliefs, and he was rejected from all the, rejected from all the elite schools. Just say, well, cuz, I'm just throwing these out, because I went to, because I went to Berkeley, because I went to Stanford, or because I went to Cornell, or because I went to Princeton University, or because I went to, no, I didn't go there. But Paul did. He will say he was raised in the institution, in the school of Gamaliel. That's like saying I sat under Aristotle. That's like saying I, I sat under Plato. That's like I say, and I studied at the masters, and I was an understudy associate of so and so and so and so and so and so. He did. He had he had the finest privilege of birth. He had the finest privilege of his in his education, and he had the finest privilege. Do you say in his in his religious society? He became a Pharisee. Because they have such a connotation of a bad name, of a hypocrisy, and so like this, we sometimes underestimate who they were. These are those folks, because of their privilege in their birth and because of their education, they got the chief seats. Paul, when, he's a, when he saw, remember, he had the authority to go to Damascus to do what? He had the authority to arrest and put into prison the people of the way of Christ. He had that. He's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. He knew the law. He knew the Septuagint. He could speak five languages fluently. You know what I thought was impressive? that Melania Trump could speak five major languages fluently. That's pretty impressive. Paul's educated. He can speak the languages. And when I see this, he recognized those things that I counted gain to me. And if you have those things, make no mistake, you've got to step up in life. 
Make no mistake about it. If you're born into a family with character and a family with money, you have an advantage. If you get to go to certain institutions for education, you will have an advantage. If you have a, a, a position in society like a Pharisee, you will have an advantage. Apostle Paul said, those things that were gained to me, I count but loss for Christ. Now look at verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I count them all but loss and have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Now, I found this interesting. I use several apps to do some Bible study and read what others write about a passage. And wouldn't you know, every one of them that has a newer translation have retranslated that to rubbish. And yet, two of the older translations stuck with what the word was translated from the original Greek to English. And the word rubbish, you'd think of trash. Now, I know that that can be vile, and I know that we'd think, well, I'll just throw that out in the trash, and that would be, that'd be okay. But it's not, near, it's not near if you realize what he actually used, the word he actually used. And for lack of a better way to say it, I count, I count everything that was gained to me compared to the knowledge of uh, the excellency of Christ, manure. And the translation of the word, an originally word, let me look here, the discarded excrement of animals. Now that's pretty vile. I know what it looks like. I know what it smells like. I know what its value is. And the Apostle Paul said here, everything that was gained to me, I count but loss. And I'm just going to illustrate the big difference here. What kind of loss? The excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Everything that was gained to me. The excrement of animals. What do you think of that comparison? I want to stress the importance. Except a man be born again. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I want you to see the big difference, no matter how good the things you can get in this life, compared to this, that I may know him, that I have a personal relationship to Jesus Christ. The comparison verse nine and be found in him. If we know the scripture says it not only be found in that he baptizes us, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, into the body of Christ. In. I'm going to be found in him. I'm going to be found in the body of Christ. I want to be counted, in, in, if I can say what a member of the body of Christ is, if I could use an analogy, I want to be a hand for Christ. I want to be a foot for Christ. I want to be an eye for Christ. I want to be, I want to be a tongue for Christ. I want to be an ear for Christ. I just want to be in the body of Christ. I want to be found that way. But also him in us. Not only baptized or put in the body of Christ, and we shall abide with him and make our abode with him, and we shall be in him forever. Through the presence of the Holy Spirit. I want to be in Christ and I want Christ in me. If, John 15, if you abide in me, I'm the, uh, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If I can just be attached to Christ. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's another whole subject. To get in by, for by grace are you saved through faith. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Just say about this. Do consider the privilege and appreciate the privilege of being in Christ. A better face this. Not being found of having mine own righteousness. And by the way, if I was to stand before Christ in my own righteousness... If the comparison of the excellency and knowledge of Christ 
is this kind of glory and this kind of beauty compared to dung. Then think of this, that all my righteousness before him is as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. Look at all the good I have before the glory of God. And Isaiah said it'd just be filthy rags. Privilege, number one, Galatians chapter four. I'll, I'll come back to it. It's one simple point. Galatians four, verse five. To redeem them that are under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. I could use the words chosen, I could use the word election, I could use the word predestined. I can think of all the high theological words we'd have to discuss, but I know this. Let's just put it this same way. By faith, place in the body of Christ, like he chooses us and gives us a new name, and it has to do with being his son. Verse number Seven, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through Christ. That's why we use the term a joint heir with Christ. Realize this privilege. I went from just being a, what he would use in that day's terminology, a servant. Someone on the outside. Someone that no matter how life went, I would still, I would never get the heritage. I would never be in the will of the master. But because of the love of God, because of his choosing before the foundation of the world, but also our operation of our will by faith in this passage, I can become a son of God. I can become joint heirs with Christ. Everything that the only begotten Son of God has by being the family of God in the triune being of one God expressed in three people, everything that Jesus Christ has and will ever have, he now shares with his brother. We divide up and hear the reading of the will, and we realize I'm in. I'm in it. I'm a son of God. I know as we speak of this, a child of God, we read in these verses, and, and I was reading verse seven, uh, verse 7, and a joint heir with Christ. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. We're real close. Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. It's not in our hymn book. It was in our old one, I believe. And maybe some of you remember singing, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. I'm bowing my knees. The whole family. I'll tell you what I, I've got in Christ. Recognize this is a privilege. I became a joint heir with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I got a title of not being a servant, someone out there, never in, to someone being in and now Part of the family. The family. They came to Jesus while he was ministering. The passage is in Matthew 12, verse 48 and 50. They came to Jesus saying his mother desired to, to speak with him or see him. And, says, and Jesus answered, who is my mother and who are my brethren? And then he says, are not these all his his disciples are not all these, my mother and my brothers and my sisters. And that's where he uses the term. Or isn't this my family? 
a personal relationship with Jesus Christ gives you a family like you, I can't even describe it, gives you a family like you can't believe. I, I call it a kindred spirit. But you can talk to someone that you've never seen, but they're a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ from another church, and you know instantly there's a bond. You can have this brother and sister in Christ, and you may not see them for years. I'll t a case in point. I think it's been once in the last three years, maybe two years, three years, only for a brief moment. We, uh, but I know we made some friends in Florida 32 years ago. On the way back from the wilds, out of the blue, that man sent me a text and said, I thank you for the influence you had in my life, and God bless you, I've been thinking about you today. I couldn't believe it. We've been, we've been separated for years, but man, that's my brother in Christ. That's my brother. And I just want us to realize, well, well let me put it this way. If it's a worthwhile note, I'll put it this way. Young people catch this. One of the biggest favors that Pastor Bowman ever got, somehow impressed upon our young people is that all your friends in the youth department here, that's your brother and sister in Christ. Call them that. We, we start calling each other you know, Sister Tammy and Brother Dean and Brother Mark. and brother. You know, we're a bunch of 14, 15, 16. You know, but we, I tell you something he pressed upon us. This was our family. This was our family. And this is the family you'll have for all of eternity. It is a privilege. By being in Christ, I'm not a servant, I'm a son, I'm a child of God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. My family just went from shoop to boom. John 15, verse 15. Now, you might recognize this from last Sunday morning. See how we work this way. John 15, verse 15. John 17 was that prayer in route where Jesus said, I pray for these, not to take them out of the world. They're not of the world, but thou should keep them in the world. That whole Message from the end of chapter 14 through chapter 17 with Jesus on his way to Gethsemane to Calvary. Do you remember how he talked with his disciples on that route? John 15, 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made un known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I'm not going to address you as my disciples. I'm not going to address you as my apostles, one set. I'm on my way to Gethsemane where I pray I'm going to be arrested. I'm on my way to Gethsemane because I know it's going to the judgment hall. And no, no attorney is going to plead on my behalf. I'm, I'm going to be condemned and I'm going to Calvary. I'm just thinking as the mind of Christ here. He has told them these things. I'm not addressing you as servants. He said, I've given you, I've given you inside information. I'm giving you heavenly information. I'm sharing with you things that are eternal word, eternal word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one jot or one tittle of God's word shall pass. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth away, but the word of God abideth forever. I have been sharing with you things that will last for all of eternity. I've been sharing you inside information from heaven above. I'm telling you the Father's plans.
Best friend you'll ever get is not your dog. Best friend you'll ever get is not your goldfish. Best friend you'll ever get, college comrade, whatever, military comrade, you can make many close, wonderful friends. And I'm just going to tell you right now, the greatest and best friend you will ever make is Jesus. And if young people and adults will find out that a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the most important thing in this life and the best thing in this life. It'll change the way people look at church and your Christianity. It won't be coattailed. It won't be, co it won't be coerced. It won't just be a civil thing to do. It'll be because at church, you're with the family of God. It'll be because at church you'll find out missions, giving, is you're investing in, in God's family. And the things you'll find out in prayer, you'll find out in the scriptures that you're finding out more about your best friend. And your best friend speaks with you through his word through his Holy Spirit thy name know the power of his resurrection get a load of this my friend went into the grave and came back out alive. That's what my friend can do. Jesus could be mutilated, killed, sealed up in a, in a cave, and my best friend can come out and say, because I can do this, I'm giving that to you. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Jesus endured a lot. I'm going to use his name. I hope he doesn't mind. But Brother Kurt was expressing to me the financial trouble that he inherited. The church he went to and stuff like that. So much so that him and his wife gave their 401k away to help get the church to the church to get him out. Just, he said somewhere along the line, the teaching, he said the people caught the spirit that, that um, the church is your family, pull your own weight, you know, and Christ is worth it. He said they don't take any offerings to this date, don't take any offerings anymore. I didn't share, we just put a plate in the back. He said, when the spirit of people finding what kind of family they had and how great Jesus was, I can't even express where they are today. I just know that this week they're going to pay cash for a million and $1.2 million building this week. They were able able to buy all their staff of their school a new car for their bonus this year. He, he just refuses, though. I don't even take a salary anymore because people just give him so much. I guess the idea is you realize the fellowship of his sufferings. I said, I, I kind of always felt that way, too. If you 
if you saw if you went out to eat with someone, wouldn't you say, I'm just gonna hold back so see if they'll pay for it? Or do you say, No, let me help with that? I always felt like if your friend was really working hard, maybe they're really behind something on the house or in the yard or something like that, and there you would you just stand there and say, Well, I'll just watch you do that, or would you say, Hey, let me help with that. Let me do the weed eating, let me push that mower. Wouldn't you do that? I, I kind of feel like we would. I think that's just good old West Virginia. Let me help with that. When people catch that same mentality at church, let me help with that. It changes everything. You don't have to have a four-week lesson on the principles of tithing and stewardship. People are just saying, let me, let me carry my weight. Let me carry my all that to come back and realize this. The fellowship of his sufferings. Jesus suffered. What a privilege. Let's not minimize this. When Job was in his deep sufferings, did you realize that three friends came, came and sat with him seven days and didn't say a word? But they came. And they sat there. Before we rail on their false assumptions and before and when they were and, and their wrong impl- thoughts and their own ideas why Job was suffering, let's at least back up and say the Bible called them his friends and they were willing to sit there in the ash heap with him for seven days. They knew the fellowship of Job's suffering. And maybe the cause of Christ is going to have its sufferings and does somewhat in these days. But I'm telling you what, do you know how you know a real, true, good friend? Go ahead. They're the ones that be with you when you're down. They're the ones that are going to sit with you at the hospital. They're the ones that are going to say, let me help you with that. And Paul says, I want to know the fellowship. I want to know the power of his resurrection. But I also want to walk with him in the sufferings. That's a true friendship. All that to come down is no disguise. The best thing and the greatest thing that anybody can have is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And to go home from camp, or to go home from a church service and say, man, I want to know him. The power and the sufferings. I realize the privilege. I see the big difference what the world has to offer and what Jesus has to offer. And I want to be found in him and knowing him. Amen? Let's close with a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed and simple Father's Day fellowship we have here together today. Our next service, we'll look at some good camp film. I think that's what we'll do. I'm going to throw something on this, Nancy. Would you look and see if you can find the hymn, A Child of the King? Let's see if that's something we're able to do. We'll sing a verse or two if we can. Holy Father, faithful, true, righteous altogether. Dear Father, let us grab a thesaurus and find every accolade we could possibly call you. But Lord, I think that Jesus Christ can be my friend. In every high and every low, I, I don't comprehend this. Lord, I pray that everyone from this day in this in the Lord's house this morning can go home and say, I want that relationship with Jesus Christ. I pray that you bless in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>